Hello everybody, welcome back. So lovely to see all your smiling faces. I hope you uh, had a good time, had a good lunch. I for sure had some time to walk around finally and uh, see some of the exhibitions. I really enjoyed the, um, in the Ethical Dilemmas Cafe, the uh, exhibition from Julia Johnson, who made like a visual representation of all the data that has been collected about her. So definitely check that out. And I also uh, went to uh, a session from Glitch, uh, one of the, the founders is Seiji, who's here for this session as well, about um, digital misogynoir, yeah. still working on the word. Super interesting on um, the particular venom targeted at black women online. And this report uh, will be published soon, so uh, check out Glitch on social media if you want to stay up to date for that. But uh, right now, because time has flown by, I can't believe this is already the last dialogues and debates uh, conversation in this Mosfest House Zonzai room. And again, it's a really important topic and um, it's about um, the right now in the age of the influencer economy, quick fame and easy money appear to be the epitome of pursuing meaning and value. But all, not all that glitters is gold, because this comes at a cost, especially considering that a lot of influencers are young adults or even minors. In the next hour, Caris Afoko, Senior Director of Communications and External Affairs at Mozilla Foundation, will guide this very crucial conversation about online exploitation and harm in the age of the influencer economy. So put your hands together for Caris, Simeon and Seiji. Thanks everyone, um, and welcome to our final dialogues and debates of Mozfest House. Um, so I'm Kara Sofoko. Um, I'm going to be chairing this conversation. I'm really excited for the panel, two brilliant speakers and authors um, whose books I will mention. So we've got Shay Akiwowo, who's written How to Stay Safe Online, which she handily has a copy of here. Um, Shay is a multi-award winning founder of Glitch, which is an amazing non-profit that helps to support women and marginalized communities and co-design practical solutions, whether that's with tech companies, governments or NGOs, to make the internet and online spaces safer for us all. Um, and so that's Shay in her book, How to Stay Safe Online, that so includes a digital self-care toolkit for resilience and allyship. I'm also joined by Simeon Brown, who is a correspondent on Channel 4 News, who currently specializes in artificial intelligence. Simeon's book, Get Rich or Lie Trying, about the influencer economy, is also out and was also published by Atlantic Books in 2022. Um, and it's really a critical examination of the, of the reality of influencer life, but also the economics that drives it. So we've got two brilliant experts in social media who've written wonderful books that sort of look at the intersection of technology, race, class, um, and specifically in the context of social media. So we're going to have a great conversation in about 40 minutes. I'm going to turn it over to you to ask all of your questions. But before we get into that, I'm going to ask both of um, the brilliant speakers here today to talk a little bit about the human stories behind their book. So one of the things I loved about reading both of your books last year was that you combined really sharp socioeconomic analysis of the internet and kind of the changes that have happened in our millennial lifetimes. I think we're all millennials here. Um, with some really, really compelling human stories. So I don't know, Simon, if you want to talk about one of the people you interviewed. For the yeah, book. sure. I mean, as a reporter, largely what you're told is no one cares what you have to say. They just care about what, you, what is your reporting on the story that you're telling. And so my book was really trying to humanize people who are in the gig economy, the actual people who are online and working. And I was very much trying to kind of critically examine the process by which these platforms are turning users into workers and basically the nature of work. And one person who I think really personified that was a man who was a migrant in Los Angeles. He came from West Africa, but he migrated as a teenager. He'd done a, a wave of kind of working class jobs and at the time, before he became a Twitch influencer, he was driving an Uber. He had always hoped to, you know, he had ambitions for his life, 
There are things that he had hoped to obtain that he didn't quite realise by the time he hit his late 30s. And one day he was driving his Uber and then somebody got into his car with a live stream. And what he didn't know was that he was now a character in this guy's live stream and he was quite a notorious kind of figure. In many ways, he was the kind of forerunner to Andrew Tate. His name was Ice Poseidon. There's so many different versions of, of these kind of characters. And he became a comic figure, the Uber driver, in this guy's sketch. And the, the people who are watching it really loved it. And so after that, he then suddenly had a new life, the Uber driver, as a, basically a character in this new kind of alt-right community. And that was basically how he began to earn a living, basically earning money from tips by going through all kinds of tasks and, and menial kind of things as a performer in this kind of attention economy. And, you know, the, I don't want to spoil, spoil it, but some of the things that he goes through are quite challenging. You know, you can pay to racially abuse him. And it really does kind of push the kind of ethics of this kind of work and in that space where there's quite a lot of critical attention now. But it really does highlight kind of question marks over exploitation, the fact that I believe that a lot of that work resembles a pyramid scheme. And it touches on a lot of fault lines along the lines of race and class and how a lot of this work actually is what a lot of working class people are now doing in the pursuit of trying to easily make it and to pay their bills. And, and I think that his story for me is, is quite uh, sharp and touching on all those, all those different fault lines. Oh, I was in gross there. Listen, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, lived experience was really important in writing this book and making sure I was centering women's voices and women plus as well, making sure... Um, I could hear, hear their experience and also learn from them because I think I'd been telling my story of online abuse for such a long time. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't in my own like offline, online echo chamber and being able to interview um, the likes of Jamila Jamil, who's an actress um, in, in Marvel franchise now, to um, Yasmin Majid um, Abdul from, uh, who was, who's Sudanese and from Australia and her experience of offline abuse and online abuse. So there's actually now a term in the dictionary called being Yasmined, where she was so horrifically abused um, by the Murdoch press that drove her out of Australia. And then that, that then uh, translated online. So there was this like ping pong effect between something being made up offline and then being posted on social media and then that becoming uh, going viral. And then that then meaning the newspapers had something to report on. And it just meant she was constantly in this felt like this, like this straight jacket of, of hyper visibility, but then being dehumanized at the same time. And to compare that then with um, policymakers who are aware of online abuse because they're in public life. So I, meant, I managed to interview um, former MP Luciana Berger, who's a Jewish woman, and seeing the nature of great replacement theory, anti-Semitism, and how that intersects with anti-blackness was, again, fascinating as somebody who's writing this book and who he's a practitioner in this space, but, like, hor hor um, horrifying to see how well-organised um, a lot of these um, bad actors are. And I think the undercurrent or, like, the the the... the the thread that ties it all together is how volatile and horrific the abuse that women receive online is and how much we waste time having to convince actors and institutions and people in power that it exists before then we can then start having a conversation about joy. And that's where I ended my book. I was like, I really wish that if we get to revisit this conversation again, that we can talk about joy online because all of these women have been robbed on opportunity to be joyful. And I actually start my book talking about being on MSN. Anyone been on MSN? That was the best time of my life. <laughs> and, you know, to end it now where, like, loads of people are not having the opportunity to, you know, earn ethical money from social media, you know, be the next Justin Bieber or the next Lizzo or whatever, um, people not being able to uh, engage in democracy. I just saw basically how women around the world have been stuck in time because they're having to fight for their humanity and their human rights because of social media, and that was really sad to see. And I think the... The thing that I'm interested in is the way that both of you connect those really powerful personal stories. And again, both books are filled with them, so you should definitely download them or buy them so you can learn a bit more. But also you looked a lot of, at structures, so tech companies to the economic systems we're all living in. Is there anything that, and I'll let either of you go first, like, is there anything that's particularly new about this moment? And is there anything that feels pretty much same old, same old? 
And again, you know, I joked about us all being millennials, but we're from that funny generation where we do remember a world that was pre-internet. And I think, Simeon, you joined Facebook while you were at uni. Yeah, 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 even at uni, yeah. Yeah, so like, and the same, and I, I think that's the same for you, Shay. So is there anything that feels really new? And is there anything that's like, this is the same stuff, just online? Um, in other ways, no. This is a weapon in which white supremacy can continue to like evolve, right? So the way it... Um, perpetuates harm online, the stereotypes of black women online, which is what the misogynoir report that was talked about earlier is going to talk about. Um, it comes out next month from Glitch. Um, whether that's um, the, the, the class division, the rich keep getting richer at the expense of poor people, as Simone was saying. Like, I, I think it's just a new weapon of perpetuating white supremacy. Why I think it's more harmful, though, so I think it, it feels different, is that, like, MSN and MySpace, I got to choose who I was in community with. And we got to, like, set those rules and, you know, we got to ask permission if we tag people in Facebook photos, can we upload them? There was, there was just so much conversation about consent that I think we shouldn't forget that doesn't even happen now. Like, you can be caught in someone's live stream, you, you were just saying, and without permission. Or the, the, the way the um, vitriol can spread quite quickly as well, I think, is, is, is new. Like, yes, there's been propaganda before, and yes, we've been using um, online platforms to um, spread propaganda, but I feel like it took time for there to be groundswell and support for right-wing media and press. Whereas this, now you can go viral within two minutes, you can harm a lot of people, and then we've seen that the online impacts the offline. So we saw Dylan Roof attacked a black church in, in America. We've seen um, uh, Jewish communities offline be hurt while, while anti-Semitism online is increasing. So I think that's the nature of it that's a little bit different, how quickly you can go viral, the speed of it, and therefore how many people you can harm. There was a fascinating piece of research done in Eastern Europe that looked at the abuse of um, women MPs, and they were able to trace back like hundreds and hundreds of horrific, abusive um, tweets uh, towards women MPs. Only went back down to six accounts. So you can see how po how powerful one really bad, volatile uh, uh, account can and the impact it can have. Whereas before, I guess it took a while to be able to like groom people into far-right conspiracies. And I think that's why we're now having the aftermath of Andrew Tate. Yes, he's been finally charged. That's going to take ages. But there are schoolboys around the world who are talking and repeating the stuff from Andrew Tate. And I think that's the sad nature of social media sometimes. So that kind of speed and scale that we can just reach in, yeah, I guess a matter of minutes sometimes. Simeon, what's your perspective? I mean, if I talk about what I was interested in, I mean, certainly what is different now is the nature of work and the fact that the way that we work is completely, completely different. And what I mean in the sense is that, you know, when I was growing up using MSN, for example, that wasn't, that wasn't work. I don't, I don't even think MSN was trying to turn me, turn me into a, into a labourer. Now if you're on Instagram, even if you're on LinkedIn, the MO of the platform is to turn you into a worker on their platform. The LinkedIn's like, become a creator now. Mm. Oh, just hit the post my CV. I didn't even want to post my CV, but now I'm saying that's the only way to get a job. So I think it's, it, that shifting nature now means that we're now in a new power dynamic with some of these platforms. And I guess, you know, my, my book is called Get Rich or Lie Trying. You know, real hip hop fans will know that comes from 50 Cent, you know, Get Rich or Die Trying, classic album, and that's where I start the text, right? But there's something deeper there where that is effectively not only just the MO of hip hop, really that's the MO of America, that's the mm -hmm. MO of neoliberalism. And it was interesting how a generation now had effectively become the personification of those values. And it was the continuation of that kind of Reagan, uh, Thatcher agenda and how that had become embraced. But, you know, the children of Thatcher, the children of Reagan, the children of Blair. Now, these, now this is now in our, in our blood substream. And this is how we see the world. And this is how we now mm -hmm. engage with the world when our money becomes everything. But that's also the MO of the tech platform themselves, right? You know, they've, they've gotten wealthy by breaking all kinds of rules, by, by lying, by hype. Bullshit is the MO of Silicon Valley. And so it was about, I guess, us and our neoliberal um, cultures, but also how the working class people in, in that, what do they do? And if they can't necessarily bullshit their way to a million pound investment, selling some dead app, 
then what it is what is it that they do do and ultimately you know you've seen the proliferation of and the return of pyramid schemes you know nfts had the same logic if you're an nft stan sorry but you know we've seen that kind of mo almost infiltrate so many of the things that become created now so i guess that is kind of why i was interested in following but through the lives of the, I guess, the digital working class and, and their stories being at the heart of it and it being more reportage than an academic reading. But I think that, for me, is where the differentiation, I guess, is most stark now. And even if you want to disengage from that, it's quite hard because of the power that they now have. Yeah. And I think something that stood out for me, and I'd be interested if people want to... Can we get a show of hands? Is anyone on social media? Is anyone on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok? OK. <laughs> Pretty much everyone. And yeah, I think that the sharpening of a politics that has existed for a while, I think, was something that really resonated with me. You know, I find myself, like, tagging brands on Instagram, like I'm Kylie Jenner or something. To be clear, I, I am not, and I have very few followers. But that, yeah, I think there's a very powerful way in which that commodification um, of our experiences from the, the innocent days of MSN, who knew we'd be uh, standing MSN today, to like, yeah, now when we're all these, yeah, I guess, actors in the influencer economy or gig economy. Um, something else I learned from Simeon's book is that the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK classes a celebrity as anyone with 10,000 followers or more. So I guess I'm interested in your personal experiences as you both have at least 10,000 followers on Twitter. Well, well it's actually 30,000. 30,000. Oh, no, OK, I wrong. Think, I think Remember, that wrong? I think across, all, across okay. all your platforms, across all your platforms, glitch as well. Ah, OK, then fine. All right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so it's maybe semi, almost celebrities. Like, how, are you, how do you navigate that? I think that's where the concept of digital self-care for me came from. So I, for my sins, was a, I'm a recovering politician. And I um, stood for election when I was um, 22, got elected at 23. So I was really young, no grey hairs and, uh, yeah, energy. Um, and uh, I, I was confronted with how little boundaries people had and the way people demanded me to respond to their casework quick, quite quickly, tagging me, things, tagging me on things on social media. And I was like, I have a Twitter account prior to like, this political career I tried to start and very, very much ended quickly. Um, and so I just I couldn't understand like, the, what felt like the erasure of my boundaries and my humanity. And then I was like, oh, this is misogyny. <laughs> you think that I just am here to serve you and to um, bow at your feet. And um, that was residents and political party members and the, the, the political party that I served. Like, it was just really bad. <laughs> and then you had the abuse on top of it as well. And then you had the low-level stuff like... Um, having to convince people that you're intelligent, because that's often the way mm. in which misogyny mm. um, happens online, um, that you're not smart enough, or smart enough or you're having to prove your credentials and stuff. So I remember having to keep really, like, say I was from LSE. Like, I had to, had to keep really saying, you know, I'm a graduate, because the way I was constantly undermined. Mm -hmm. And actually writing the book helped me, helped me unlearn and heal from some of the misogyny that I didn't even realise, right? You just have to move on. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent to say <laughs> that um, digital self-care, I think, is about us being more informed about, our dis about our, the way we navigate social media platforms mm -hmm. and what we say yes to, what we say no to. And I think part of the power of your book is that it's going to empower working class people to be like, do I want to keep sharing my data with this platform? Do I want to keep engaging with this? Um, and I, I, I do not shy away from blocking people. I don't shy away from preemptive pre blocking as well. If I've seen you be a bit of a dickhead to somebody else, I'm not going to wait for that to come my way, so <laughs> I will block you. Um, and I think that's the way to kind of keep sane online. And I get that's hard because you've got celebrities who are being told any form of engagement is good, even if that is at the expense of their mental health. But then we've also seen the bravery of um, Lizzo recently, who, who said... I think I'm going to have to come off social media because I can't take the fat phobia that's happening on the platform. Um, and I think digital self-care is about understanding how can we still use these pieces of technology that allows us to communicate and have fun and follow you know, shows like you, Netflix, or Black Mirror for whoever watches that, that show. I can't get into it. Not me, too scary. Or Succession. 
Yeah. 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 No, follow with people at the, without it now meaning, you know, it's at the de detriment of your mental health because that's the new wave of information that I think is going to come out. How much social media has impacted our mental health? Mm. Simeon, how do you navigate online spaces as a non-celebrity but with some <laughs> followers? I mean, you're on Channel 4. Yeah, as a... It's, it's, it's an interesting one. I, my relationship is... I, I don't think it's particularly linear. So sometimes my Instagram is closed, sometimes it is open. Depends if I posted something that I think I want it to go wider or not. But for the most part, I haven't cultivated it as a space where I'm trying to just blow it up. And a part of that is that you could say I have not felt the need to kind of cultivate myself as a social media figure because I'm a broadcaster on old school mainstream TV where, you know, you can broadcast. So I haven't felt the same pressure to be a part of that rat, that rat race, although that's not to say that there isn't a relationship between journalism and that economy. Um, but largely for a period of time, I wasn't really on Twitter that often. And only now, as I say, I've returned to it. Um, you know, posting more regularly. For a year, I was maybe tweeting once a month, maybe. Um, so I think my relationship, it, it, does, it does vary, but I think I spend too much time on the gram, even if it's closed, just preying, um, which is, if you don't know, it's a slang term for just, like, watching, creeping. Um, but I, I would say that not being a woman means that I don't really get abuse like that, to be honest with you. And... Racial abuse might come if I maybe report a certain thing that someone disagrees with, but I just won't engage with them, to be honest with you, and I just keep it moving. But I do think that if you're a woman on the internet, your abuse is just 100 times worse. And even I think about some of my colleagues, we're, we're not experiencing the same thing online. Mm. That's for certain. And I want to talk a bit about technology companies. You both touched on them, um, and Shay is, uh, has been has engages with them very actively. Engage um, is a good diplomatic word. <laughs> um, but I think, well, I want to start with place. I mean, one of my favourite bits of your book is where you talk about we're all Californians now um, and the sort of Californication of the internet and tech spaces. Like, do you want to talk a bit about the impact of that? And then, Shay, I'd love to hear a bit about your experience of get, engaging with platforms? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, California has always been the home of the attention economy even before there were apps. You know, it was the home, it's the home of Hollywood. And even prior to that, it, you know, that is where the whole notion of a gold rush began when people were leaving their homes all across Europe to go and take part in this, you know, gold rush. Um, so obviously today we understand that to be a gold rush in like data and, and other things. But the significance of having all these companies that are based in this very small part of the world has largely been a part of a, the projection of American soft power and the fact that that has reshaped so many kind of cities in the world in their image. And even when I think about when I used to travel when I was younger, you know, every city didn't look the same. You know, you, know, you really do get a sense of how branded the world is now mm -hmm. and so what I was talking about was really how the values of America had become largely become so popularized not just by American cultural product like television but just the apps themselves and how that's changed our behavior and so when you read a stat that says 80 percent of the world uses Google and then Facebook and Instagram it's like that has a real kind of cultural imprint and so in the attention economy and the way that we behave and our values for me it was about it was about us thinking about the, the power implications of that in the book. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily an overtly original perspective, but certainly seeing it in the lives of these people, I wanted to remind the, the reader of just how you know, we are in a geopolitical game as well. And that has taken a lot of originality out of the world and put a real cultural imprint. And so it has its globalization as colonial imprint almost. And I think, I think sometimes we can forget that. Mm. Yeah, I think that's, that the globalization is really important to underline because <clears throat> a lot of tech companies' excuse for why they can't put in the, the necessary safeguarding policies and terms and conditions and deploying their algorithms right so that it's making the platform somewhat of a fair public square is because they're like, oh, we have to keep contextualizing. We have to keep making sure that like our policies work for different countries. And you're just like, 
yeah, duh. And I think there is a kind of like America first, America best, America worldwide, which is why I think TikTok is a massive challenge to the US right now. And we're seeing a lot of geopolitics happening in the in the the guise of wanting to protect America's interest and actually I think a lot of xenophobia around China. Um, but TikTok have a very different um, approach to their platform. Uh, Meta's platforms, uh, Instagram, in Facebook, uh, um, and uh, WhatsApp are all about put, protecting the First Amendment, freedom of, of expression and speech. Whereas uh, TikTok's, as a, as a second generation platform, is about joy and safety and is understanding that young people are going to need more support, more safeguarding. And I think, therefore, you have quite two different um, platforms. Now, I'm not saying TikTok doesn't have, don't have their own things to be um, addressing and, and dealing with, but I think from, the, from having a very different intention for what the platform is for, I think you see it being used in, uh, in, in different ways. Um, I, I, like when you asked the earlier question, Karis, about, you know, is this the same? That's what I mean by I don't think technolo this technology is anything new in how it's being used to continue white supremacy in continuing to um, have power imbalance, um, keep disempowering the working class, make us apathetic, make us tired, make us overworked, burn out, burn us out, um, flood us with information, um, um, surveillance as well. We haven't even got into that. That's another hour. But I, I, I think <laughs> I, I, I do worry about the idea that a tech platform based in one city, in one country, thinks it can scale its product world, worldwide and there be no repercussion or regulation or no, or no kind of like uh, oversight body around that. And that's the role I think my tiny organisation with Dr Julia at the back there is trying to, trying to do, is trying to capture the movements of tech companies and hold them accountable for it, to try and... Uh, turn the language that they use, the policy language that kind of like makes you kind of like glaze over and go, well, this is boring, and like make it culturally relevant for our communities to empower them, using the examples of Lizzo or Meghan Markle or Beyonce um, as a conversation starter around like this is happening on our front doors and we can we can do something about it. Um, and I, that's what keeps me going, though, because I do have hope in the fact that more people are, are waking up to the fact that tech companies actually aren't on our side and are definitely aren't on black people's side. Like, TikTok is black culture, Twitter is black culture, and yet um, we've seen discrepancies in how tic black TikTok creators are paid versus white TikTok creators and the support, the amplif amplification they get. Um, and so... I am excited by, I think, a counter movement that is growing. And I think the, the fact that we have a space like this to have a conversation about social media um, in, with this analysis shows that we're, going, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's an interesting, I want to talk a bit about the future and about things going on at the moment, like generative AI. But I guess I wanted to also, I think something that really lands powerfully from both of your work is the way that social media reinforces atomization and individuality. So that at its worst, in both of your books, you've got you, who's been horrifically abused online, kind of victim-blaming and being told by everyone from the police to loved ones, like, well, what did you do? And can you take the tweet down? And how can you make it stop? And then, you know, Simeon, you have young women having cosmetic surgery aggressively marketed to them so that they can become a fashion over babe and which you know you tie together with undocumented women working in factories to sort of satisfy this fast fashion need and there is a way that social media is so individualizing and so then you're this tiny pixel unit in this sort of big scary world dominated by a few American tech companies run almost exclusively by white American guys, where where do we find the collectives that we need to challenge that? And like, where's the hope, or where do you find hope, or where do you see resistance to challenge something that can be yeah profoundly sort of alienating and scary? Well, Mozilla Fest for one. <laughs> well, uh, Didn't ask him to say that. Uh, I, sh I was paid to say that, by the way. Hashtag <laughs> ad. No, no. I mean, you know what? I would say that. The nature of being a journalist, sometimes you'll say, oh, this is a problem, and then you have to worry about the solution so much, you're like, not my problem kind of thing. Mm. 
And uh, I'll say I'm definitely guilty of that in the book. But I, I do feel that yesterday's um, speech by mm. Francis was really, really good about, you know, the need to have hope and the need to, uh, to collectivise. And the truth is, is that, you know, we were in session today looking at how you know, everyone's feed on social media is so personalised. That's what the algorithm does. And so if you look at, like, collective-based public culture, you know, it's really hard to even... They're having a problem in Hollywood right now trying to create the new basically Tom Cruise or whatever, because fundamentally no one is watching the same films anymore. So there is no kind of mass popular culture, there's just individual cultures um, when it comes to celebrity anyway, not so much when it comes to what we're using or what we're consuming. These mm. things are becoming more concentrated, but in terms of what we're, who we recognise as being someone that is famous. And so when we think about that impact, I think that collectivism has become slightly harder. We're working more remotely. You know, if we are working at home by ourselves, how do you organise, you know, we are the workers? So mm. these kind of things are, are, are shifting a lot. But I think that, you know, IRL is very important. Um, I think coming together with p people in spaces like this, I think I like the size of the conference. I think that it doesn't feel so big that you don't talk to people. I think it has a level of intimacy, which is quite important for building connections. And so I think that that connection is, is really key, but also really importantly, you have to kind of keep hope. And I think as a journalist, uh, I think I've been quite cynical, but certainly being at the festival, I think as you may be maybe more optimistic about the possibilities and thinking about actually, do you know what? You have to keep that hope and faith and just meet and just being one or two people who, you know, share a similar sense of, of hope as well can be really galvanizing. So, you know, keep, keep hope alive and, you know, come and connect and, you know, then let's link up. Hopefully that would be lit as well. Um. I think there are collectives really uh, organising. So um, last year, Glitch launched a campaign um, to try and get women and girls mentioned in the online safety bill. Um, for those that don't know, the, the online safety bill is a proposed regulatory bill um, that isn't what it isn't what it was set out to be anymore. in the UK. <laughs> in the UK, um, and. Uh, we, there are 262 pages in this bill and women are mentioned in n none of those pages, zero times. And for the last year, we've had over 100,000 people support the campaign. We've had influencers that would not necessarily like work on a campaign together for a brand or whatever, joining forces and supporting our campaign. And I think the more that we've had women share their lived experiences online about abuse or about... Um, shadow banning and censorship, um, the more people have been able to kind of say, oh, actually, that's a similar experience that I've had. How can I be part of this? And I think we are seeing more collectives um, and organisers. The issue, I think, is funding. So we are up against a multi-billion pound for-profit making company and organisers like Glitch um, as a charity, um, Level Up, um, uh, your small organisations across Europe are doing this amazing work on a shoestring budget, and it's not a fair equal fight. Um, the and I think that needs to change. I think if we want to really support collectives, I think it's a supporting how we organise them, um, and that's through resourcing. I think that's through grant reporting. I think that's through leadership. I think that's through centering self care. A lot of our freedom fighters, a lot of our digital right freedom fighters, are burnt out. And if we want to play the long game against white supremacy, it means that we have to look after ourselves. And to quote Audre Lorde, who I talk about in the book, which is where the concept digital self-care comes from, we really have to look after ourselves. So there is definitely a collective growing and emerging, but I do worry about the long game. Mm. And I think that's the sustainability part we need to be talking about if we really want to take down um, or at least hold these institutions to account. I think it's also in the power of storytelling. So I think we need more of our marketing people, our comms people that have been working with tech companies or with brands to now come and join the good fight and help us explain these very like boring concepts of regulation <laughs> and trust and safety and gig economy to, to the average folk who have got a lot going on their plate. Like before we started, we were talking about the cost of living, mortgage rates, like that's just before we started this depressing conversation, <laughs> you know? So I, a, lot of a lot of people from working class communities, the ends, have got a lot going on that now you're now telling them they need to become a digital citizen and now understand privacy and now need to be like helping their kids, not just with their homework, but like how to work out 
game, gaming platforms and Xbox, like that's too much. And so I think there needs to be a way that we can make our movement sustainable in terms of self-care, but also in the language that we're kind of um, using to, to educate without being, um, what's a nice word? Uh, what's a nice word I want to use? I want to be diplomatic. <laughs> Don't be diplomatic. <laughs> Without being a dickhead. <laughs> um, I think there's language that we can use to make sure we're not um, alienating people. I think the digital rights community um, has been very embracing of glitch, but it's taken a very long time for there to be a conversation about race when it comes to digital rights. And even with Black Lives Matter or Black Square Summer, we still haven't seen the progression on racial conversations in tech um, who are leading um, the, the, the collectives we're talking about. A lot of the collectives that have been organised by women, by black women, have been now um, taken over by, by white women um, in the name of diversity. I mean, I can go on. <laughs> the collective is there, but I think there is a, there's internal warfare happening that I think requires a big conversation if we want to be up against the giants of like Facebook and Twitter. Mm. OK, well, we're going to come to you soon for your questions, but I want to switch up and talk a little bit about the future. You both wrote books about technology, which means that in the space of a year, a lot has happened because things move fast. So I guess I wanted to hear a bit about what you didn't get to put in the book that you want to talk about now. Anything that you missed or anything that's happened in the last 12 months that, yeah, you're interested in. Yeah, I mean, so I was writing about precarity and how people facing economic precarity in terms of trying to find jobs were turning to their salvation via creating content on platforms on the internet. Obviously, there are some huge content creators who have made big livings from it, but for the most part, the majority of people are struggling, and ironically, they're working for these trillion-dollar platforms to create content, but not getting really the rewards for that. So they've, they've become workers in that, in that rat race. Now, the, what I didn't write about so much was that in the future, everyone's going to be, well, in the present, everyone's going to be competing against AI-generated content too. So that in itself now becomes another area of precarity. And so I think generative AI was something that I didn't write so much about in terms of generative content creators. And when I look at now how many of the platforms that some of these people are on now are, are t t pulling out money where they were investing into original content, even like YouTube, who took, took out their, who ended their original creators program and have basically put that money into generative AI, it's like, Fundamentally, this creates another area of kind of competition and, and, and concern. So I think overall, looking at basically who wins from this industry, who the winners are, who the losers are, and why the winners need to pay more and why they need greater accountability and why they need, in some cases, arguably to be taken apart, I think that was an area that I probably should have done more on and had more foresight, and, and I think probably that's going to be dominating the conversation for the next year or so. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll come back on the generative AI stuff, but I think something that I wish, if I had more time, the book is already 20,000 words over, because <laughs> um, there's a lot to say. But if I could have another 10,000 words, I, I think I would, I would have talked about a little bit more about my concerns about Elon Musk. I think... Um, I think as an activist and as a, as a CEO and founder of a, a charity in this scene, the Elon Musk takeover really knocked me back. It really disheartened me because we had made such progress, particularly with Twitter as a platform, mm. on hateful conduct, on dehumanizing, dehumanizing. We got them to say the word intersectionality. Like, for us, this is low bar stuff. But for them, that is massive progress. And it was disheartening to see how... The conversations around Elon Musk take, takeover was missing the analysis, was missing the socioeconomic analysis that was needed, was missing the ramifications. It became about sensationalizing him and made it about the Elon Musk show rather than what it meant for Twitter and the layoffs and where the layoffs were happening. They were happening in trust and safety teams. It was happening in the privacy teams. It, you know, th that stuff was missing because everyone just wanted to keep talking about Elon Musk and making that the, 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 the clickbait, I guess. Um, and my concern with his takeover, which obviously I didn't get to mention because it happened afterwards, was that he basically started a race to the bottom to do the minimum that was required to have a tech company function. Um, he disbanded the Trust and Safety Council, which Glitch uh, sat on for three years prior. 
I, I can't believe I've been asking for Jack Dorsey to come back. L that's what Elon Musk has done to me. Um, <laughs> But he, he started something that now Facebook and which own too many uh, platforms, in my opinion, um, are now copying. So they remo removed the kind of um, the verification um, blue tick, which was very important lifeline in, in keeping safe um, for, uh, online, particularly for public figures um, and making sure you're, you, know, you can decide who you're actually talking to is, is real. The API, which allows researchers to access the platform on Twitter. Um, to do the research that we have and that we know stats like black women are 84% more likely to be abused online than white women. That's because, a because Twitter opened its API and that's now gone. Um, and we've now seen other platforms follow suit. And so I wish we I could have talked a bit more about the race for the bottom um, that we're now seeing and that now we're requiring other platforms like TikTok to kind of lead the way when it comes to trust and safety and privacy. But yeah, it was a shame just to see how many journalists were making it about the Elon Musk show mm. than about what this meant for tech and pla platform accountability. Mm. On the generative AI, I think because we haven't had the conversation about racial biases in data sets yet properly, we haven't had the conversation around digital blackface and the fact that you can get a filter on these platforms to make yourself look 10 times darker, like... That is blatant colorism is so problematic because we've not been able to have those conversations. Now generative AI means that brands can fake black models and not pay them. Like there is such a, we're so behind in the conversation that generative mm. AI has like widened that gap. Mm. Um, and the biggest thing I always say is like, who gets to be in these rooms? So we have a, we have a Slack channel kind of thing at Glitch and it's of, there's one on venting, basically, where we see things <laughs> the and we get to vent. <laughs> and one was where we, need we that. <laughs> yeah, one where we saw was three white guys got paid um, a hefty amount of money, like millions and millions for an I idea. They didn't even have a website. They had a page on their website and they were able to generate millions and millions of um, pounds on generative AI. And I was just thinking, what about the, you know, the black working class boy or girl in, in Stratford or in, in X, X city in, in Europe that won't ever get a chance to have that amount of money to, to influence tech for the good. And mm. th it means that we're always just like chasing our tail a little bit mm. when it comes to generative AI. <sighs> okay. So before we throw over to your questions, I'm gonna ask just, I'm gonna ask a question about joy. Where do you get your joy on the internet? I think both of you talk about black Twitter in your book, which is a place that I get my joy. You know, mine was critique, though. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> um, Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a critique, that's true. But where else, where else do you get your joy? What are you preening on Instagram? Where am I getting my joy? Or is it offline? Yeah, so um, this is not uh, a secret, but I went off work last year for three months from burnout. From uh, I went on a sabbatical. And it meant that I had a, I came back with a massively different relationship with work and with um, tech as a part of it. And I think being able to just stay in my body and like listen to my body's signs, like, is that a burp or do I need to go to the toilet? Like, am I hungry or do I need water? Like, you know, listening to my body's like signs again, I think meant that I was connecting to myself, that I just mm. didn't realize how much being on social media and working and working remotely just disconnected me from my body. And I think that's where I find joy in like going to tap classes. And, and then look, look at me. I will still record them and post it on Instagram to get likes as well. So I'm part of the problem. <laughs> but, no, keep posting <laughs> dance classes. They're joyful. They're joyful. But I, I, I think I have been finding a lot of my joy offline in order to stay being online. Simeon? From the internet, from joy. I mean, I mean, I still find the meme pages funny. So the meme pages still have me in bondage every now and again. <laughs> um, the meme pages are cool. Um, but largely, although I do spend a disproportionate amount of time online, I think a lot of that is because I do work in news, and I think that if I left news behind, I would like to think that I would leave behind a lot of my life online, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, this season, for most of it, the Arsenal gave me joy. If you pick up the Arsenal fans in the building, next season's coming home. Um, <laughs> you know, my, my family as well, you know, and my daughter. So I think... Oh, my daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I think, I think that, that's probably where my, my joy is. And connecting with cool people. 
in Amsterdam. Big up Amsterdam. Yeah. So, yeah. Everyone give yourselves a round of applause. It's been an amazing month there. Um, yeah, and it was great to hear, like, there's been a lot of joy, I think, today and yesterday in this space. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to everyone here um, to ask Shay and Simeon questions or, you know, share thoughts or comments. Anything you've heard you want to hear more about, don't be nervous. And I don't know if we're taking questions online. Okay, we've got someone at the front. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great. I learned a lot. I wanted to ask you, well, you mentioned that you were disheartened by Twitter because you fought so hard for it to improve and then it just uh, got so much worse. Uh, do you believe in the possibility of alternatives so that we can, so that communities can set up their own digital infrastructure, their own social media, and say kind of fuck you to big tech and be able to dictate the rules of their, yeah, of their own platform? Yeah, I do. I think I really like your language you use there as well, big tech, because I think that's a differentiation. I think a lot of people from, from the communities that I come from associate tech with Facebook. Like, it's just so one and the same. So if actually we can say there's an alternative. Like, it doesn't have to just be Facebook and Twitter. Um, I think that will allow us to start seeing the possibilities. Um, but then I then think about the pandemic and two platforms did really well during the pandemic, Clubhouse and House Party, who had less content moderation policies, policies in general, than Twitter. So I was a little bit like, I've been fighting for Twitter to be better, and you guys have all run on Clubhouse. Help me help you, you know? <laughs> so I think there's a little bit on us as consumers to, to understand our power in, in our clicks and our power and where we, where, where we go um, alongside the alternatives. Um, because what happened was white flight, I think, with Elon Musk, where everyone going to the Macedon platform, um, which, again, didn't have the same kind of content moderation that is needed. I think what would be a very powerful consumer kind of like tool, and if anyone wants to talk to me about this afterwards, particularly for a funder, um, <laughs> is some kind of like um, consumer benchmarking where we get to vote on certain aspects that we need to see on a platform before we can go on it. So like Food Standard Agency, for example, like most people won't go to a Chinese that's got rating of like three and below, right? Unless it's really good. Um, <laughs> how do we have that kind of like consumer rating and voting on platforms? Because I would like to know what platforms ranked according to like what I care about, which is safety for black women, where I can talk about issues on social justice, where I can not have my data kind of like used against me. Maybe if we could, if we could crowdsource some principles that we want to see as consumers, then we can start voting with our clicks of like where to go. Because I do think alternative platforms exist, right? It's just, again, it's the problem of like, it's white men in tech that keep creating these alternative platforms that keep perpetuating the same things that I guess I and my community that I come from are concerned with. Did I answer your question? Yeah, for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for it. This has been fantastic. And my fr uh, question is that I uh, have been thinking a lot about friction and the way it happens, right, in online spaces. And I'm wondering, like, really thinking about what is it to see frictions among existing stakeholders as a force for, for positive systems change? and resisting the illusion of frictionless technology um, to ask what if we could design specific kinds of friction back in in order to enable slowing down self-reflection, conflict resolution, collaboration, learning, and care. And mm -hmm. really, really curious about your thoughts on that. So is that, when you say by friction, you mean like creating conflict to create change? In the way that online harms happen, like, of course, there's always like bad actors too, but also AI and the way that algorithmic systems amplify other kinds of harms and injustice. So, is that about slowing? I think you spoke a lot about speed, Shay. Is that like slowing people's ability to like type something and post it? Or, yeah, that's an example for yeah. design friction, right? Or the way that I'm wondering, I mean, there's okay. this sort of strive for frictionless technology that mm. sort of constantly makes it kind of gets people to fit into a business model, all right, or... Well, I think TikTok's got... It's pretty good. And again, I'll declare that like, I'm on the Trust and Safety Council of TikTok. That's why I know a lot about it, not that I am now doing secret PR for it. It's not, it's not a hashtag ad. Um, 
I think they are trying to design nudges so that there is a lot more thinking through rather than just reacting to stuff. So there's nudges around um, how long you've been on the platform. Um, do you really want to post that? Um, and I think there is. I think that is an exciting way to encourage digital citizenship. I think I would love there to, for someone to create or spark a conversation around um, nudges around accountability. Because so I think that's something that we're seeing a massive friction on. Like we want to hold institutions to account, and some for some people, social media tweeting. Um, you know, look, I think, um, what were they even called before? Avery, the, the um, delivery delivery company? Oh, the terrible one. The terrible one. Uh, Hermes. 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 I think Hermes has a deep <laughs> Is this a UK like, thing? So when you, you order Hermes a package, it either gets DPD and you're like, thank the Lord. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you used to get Hermes and you'll be like, this is going to get thrown in a dustbin. Thrown in the dustbin. And I think away. Hermes had to go for a rebrand because of Black Twitter. Because the amount of complaints where you are waiting for your order and you take a photo of how long it's taken for it to arrive and it causes this, this ground groundswell or, you know, injustices of like police brutality and been able to take videos of that. But then you've got a friction with black communities that want to keep seeing a black man be murdered or a black woman be harmed by the police or by someone else. So I'd be interested in how nudges could be used so that you can either opt out or opt in of seeing those, seeing that kind of content, or at least the person posting it, having a moment to think, why am I posting this? And I talk a lot in my book around how do you hold people accountable without now going into mob mentality of like, like I'm going to get justice in my own, in my own way. That would be fascinating because I think technology is here to is here to stay, um, um, it, but I don't think it needs to be in this way. And I think nudging people to use it with digital self care in mind and with allyship in mind would be a much positive direction than we're seeing right now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, another question over there. Um, thank you so much for the fabulous talk. Um, the question is short one around. We're seeing a lot of governments domestically making statements about AI mm. um, in the UK, for example, but also in Europe, banning ChatGPT in Italy and other countries. And um, I'm concerned maybe whether some of that will become a political football. And then what do you think is a good way of approaching some of that? And where do you think we can... Uh, not fall into the same sort of traps that you kind of described with Elon Musk and so on. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know what? It's, it's funny because I've been covering a lot of AI stories. That, that's largely what I'm covering at the moment at Channel 4. And there is a lot of smoke and mirrors in that conversation, almost to the point where most days when there's some big headline, I'm almost like, I don't even think we should be covering this because you can see a lot of the spin which... Companies say that this technology is awful whilst raising billions in it and putting more money into it. So it's like, what's really going on here? And there's a lot of positioning of these companies so that they can dominate that space and close the competition. Whilst at the same time, we do know that there are very real regulatory issues that we need and also issues around the thing that they don't want to talk about, which is like taxation and, and ownership and, and therefore what, what comes back to the public. So I think that it's really important just, I guess, to focus on the issues. But if people are activists and people are, you know, developers, but on the side of the public, there has to be a real kind of organising organisation taking place right now to really ensure that the agenda is clear and, and people and journalists know what it is. Because at the moment we are very reactive. Mm. And so at most newsrooms, I don't even think necessarily that we are that clued up on the conversation and even what regulation really means in terms of we're talking about licensing now, what is it particularly that we're talking about here so i think that there is an opportunity right now to kind of organize around an agenda of these are things that matter this is what we should be talking about and everything else becomes kind of bluster so i think that that really should be taking place in forums like 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 this so that there is a clarity of, of what the real meat and potatoes are I really like your question. Are you a Brit? Yeah. Yay. Um, I really like your question. I think I want to answer it in two ways. One, we have elections coming up. 
um, some, at some point, definitely in the UK in the next 18 months, but also there's EU elections. And I, I think 2024 has been labelled like election of like the election because everyone's having an election. Um, and I would love to see um, us make that uh, an election about technology. I would, and I say this as again a recovering politician, where when I'd go on the doorsteps, and my thing back then was caring about youth violence because I had so many young people shot, murdered, or killed, or stabbed in my area that it broke my heart. That's why I stood. But when I knocked on doors, people only want to talk to me about their bins. People only want to talk to me about parking. So how do we make? tech, privacy, social media, online abuse, a voter issue on the doorstep. How do we make it when someone knocks on the door and they're campaigning for your vote or they're giving you a phone call or now they're emailing and texting, which is very annoying. How do we say, yeah, I'll vote for you, but let me know where you stand on the online safety board in the UK or where do you stand on the Digital Services Act if, if it's a European election? Let's push our, um, our, our, our public officials to become the experts that we need them to be to regulate tech. That's the first way I want to answer your question. Um, I do think a lot of the doom and gloom of tech, chat, GBT, and all of that is a distraction, as, as Simeon said. I think it's a distraction so that we become apathetic. Um, I think it's a capitalist distraction so that you work harder because you're scared that tech's going to come and take your job. So that's a great way to like, extract more labor from people and overwork them. Um, and I think it's, it's, a it's a distraction from actually what's happening on the platform. So these are products that they want us to know about. There are products that they have sitting, ready to go, that they don't want us to know about, that gets launched on the sly. And I think we need a version of, um, so you have, we have like fact, check, fact checkers. We need that for around like AI. We need like AI checkers because there is just so much lies out there and people are being are believing that chat GBT is this like breakthrough thing. It, it isn't. I, I've spoken to techies and they say it's no bigger than autocomplete on your email. Like it's not that big of a thing. And so how do we again, this is why I said before, how do we get the marketing comms people that were working on that side to come to our side to help us translate some of this uh, techie stuff so that we've got more consumers and now voters making decisions about the future of tech? I think that's a great note to end it on. I'm going to get, ask you to do a few rounds of applause. First of all, for our brilliant panellists. Thank you so much. Um, and then... Because this is the last D&D, a really big round of applause for all of our production team and all of the people. All of the humans have been buzzing around, micing people up, showing people where to go. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Um, and then the final things I need to tell you are, you can join us in 4 p.m. here for a song circle with Toshi Reagan, which is going to be amazing. I missed yesterday's. So I'm going to be here for today's. Um, and yeah, just enjoy the rest of MozFest. Thank you all so much for Thank coming. Thank you. And joining the